All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. So I'll go ahead. I learned a little bit from the sales team. You know, if you set low expectations and exceed them long term, so this is really going to suck. It's going to be boring. You know, this is it wasn't put together with a lot of effort. So. Um, it did, yeah. <laughs> We can do it all, it's going to be incredible, and it's free. So, go ahead and let you, uh, just a reminder, the reason we do this is for to meet our compliance and our regulatory uh, commitments. So, our training sessions that we do here, uh, we will have a sign-in sheet when Katie gets here. Make sure you sign that, or you'll have to do this again. Uh, and uh, if you're online, Katie will be sending you something to sign in remotely as well. So, we, we keep a record of all who signed in. And they, when they come in and do our audits, they compare that who was hired at the time to make sure everybody went through the training. And we have to show them the content of our training sessions as well. So if you remember from our last security sessions, they were very broad. We covered a lot of topics, a lot of information. It was really long. It was drinking from a fire hose. And we said, hey, we're going to change this, be a little bit more specific. We're going to talk about one specific topic moving forward. So, um, so I, I, as I was doing this research for this topic, this is the, something I found written online. They said, people have been catching fish for centuries. This is mainly because they're stupid. They said, well, the fish, not the people. They said, you can fool them by putting a lure in the water that reminds them of something they like to eat. Then they chomp down on it. They said, the internet's like a pond. And they said, we and we are the fish. So our topic today is fishing. And I know immediately what you guys are going to think. You're going to say, well, fishing, I mean, come on, we're, we're all IT guys. We're not going to, you know, fall captive to this, but you know, as I've gone through this and I, I initially started thinking the same thing, and this is really kind of getting out of control and it's getting a lot worse. So I think it's a good reminder. I think we kind of come into this thinking, well, I'm not going to fall victim to that. It's a good reminder. As soon as you get that mentality, you're probably going to get hit up. So just real quick, the threat. Uh, you know, fishing is really old fashioned. You know, it's been a long, around a long time and it's continuing to increase. In fact, last year, it was 87% increase. Uh, in fishing attacks. Um, and the stakes are high. You said one out of every 200 fishing attacks is successful. And the average cost of a fishing attack, you know, if we got fish, someone using our brand name, over $150,000 our organization. The traditional methods that we used to use to stop this, they just aren't working and it's getting worse. So, you know, reputation, there's a lot of numbers here. Uh, but I like this one here at the bottom. Customers are 42% likely, less likely to do business with you if you're aware of phishing attacks against your brand. And I think as we continue to grow and our footprint continues to grow and, and we service more um, you know, cities and more customers, we're just starting to become a bigger and bigger target all the time. If you look at this research right here from 2013, it is showing that CISOs were asked what are some of your most prevalent issues you're dealing with from a security perspective, the most severe risks that you're taking on. And if you look, there's hacking, uh, there's identity theft, but phishing is up here at the top, is one of the most uh, biggest issues that they're dealing with. And if you look, in the second half of 2012, 7% of all email was malware, and 5% of all email was phishing distribution. It says the average phishing site's only up for 44 hours. And in that 44 hours, they're targeting 720 different brands. And something else we'll talk about, mobile users, which, I mean, everybody, you know, we all know we're going more and more mobile. Three times more likely to fall for a phishing scan than PC users. So let's talk real quick about some of the examples and, and how this is happening. You know, it used to be we'd get the, well, hey, I'm the prince of Abu Dhabi, and I want to give you $2 million if you'll just give me your bank account information. You know, and that... That, that's the old fishing stuff we used to think of, right? Well, this is getting much, much slicker. They're targeting us to where it hurts. So they're going to find out what are you susceptible to. Are you susceptible to money? How about fear? How about threat? How about uh, winning a contact, you know, drugs? Whatever it is, they're, they're hitting multiple facets. Of this one here, for example, they set, sent out a failed billing notice from GoDaddy. If we sent out a thousand emails to just random people, likely four or five people by the website hosted with GoDaddy. You're going to see you have a failed billing notice. Most people probably don't even look to see what the domain name is. They're going to click on the link because, hey, if i got a failed billing notice, that means they're going to shut down my website. You know, if I'm selling or communicating to my customers, I need to get that up and running quickly. They go to a bogus website, enter in their credentials. It doesn't work. 
they call GoDaddy thinking they got the wrong credentials, are already locked out. In the meantime, the hackers already gathered their information, and in the background, they're just going to now hijack this website secretly on the back end to use to mitigate and further distribute their phishing attempts. Do you think it's all totally randomized, or do you think it's actually targeted? <coughs> There's both, and we, we talk about that a little bit later as well. <clears throat> Uh, Bank of Montreal, we talked about, I get this phishing email and I got to go to their web, I click on a link and it's going to take me to a website. And here's an example, which, which website looks like a phishing site? I mean, you, you can't tell. I mean, they're doing a great job of making these sites look very professional. And in fact, sometimes you're going to put in your credentials and it's going to pass you on to the valid site in the back end and you've never known it. Which one is the phishing I could never find out. Oh. <laughs> Uh, this one is Royal Bank of Canada. Again, they send you to a site saying you're having some uh, account security concerns. Um, please activate your, reactivate your account now. And again, they're, they're feeding on that fear of, oh, there's something wrong with my bank account. This one is a little bit more elaborate. Uh, this was fairly recent, American Express. Again, this was sent out a blast email to hundreds of thousands of people. I guarantee you lots of them have American Express. Um, and if you look, there's a couple things that look fairly slick. Uh, it, it's got the logo, it looks professionally done, it's well written. Uh, if you look at the link, it says AmericanExpress.com and even HTTPS, it looks like it's going to take you to a secure link and I know as a lot of us know, we hover over that. That may not really be taking us to AmericanExpress.com. We actually got one. Yeah. If you look at from address, it says American Express, even fraud at AEXP.com. Again, if you're in a hurry, if you thought you had fraud, you've probably been a victim of fraud once and trying to avoid it again, at, at first glance, yeah, it looks like American Express uh, what, uh, email address, but it's not. In fact, if you hovered over this link that we talked about here in the bottom and find out it went to somewhere else, well, it took you to one of 419 URLs uh, or one of 57 compromised web servers. Each of these were index pages, or the pages they were sent to uh, was, say, connecting the server while it loaded three or four JavaScripts on your computer to do some other malicious activity. Soon afterwards, you were taken to a site that looks like American Express. If you go out to the real American Express site, this looks like it today. Um, and they want you to enter your username and password. The only thing is, if you kind of look at the toolbar, you'll find out that's not AmericanExpress.com. It's a compromised server. Then they want you to enter your social security number, your birth date, mother's maiden name, her birth date, and a PIN number. I mean, that, that's not going to happen. If, if you have fraud in your account. And they're not going to ask you for your card number, but they did here. And then they're going to ask you for the expiration date. So now I have everything they need to do to take over your account. Uh, you know, they're banks, so, uh, credit card, they're not going to ask for that type of information. Then when you're done, they're going to reward you with 5,000 or 5,000 reward points as a thank you, which aren't really reward points, but you'll feel good about giving them all your information. So this was actually used to break hundreds of American Express cardholders' accounts and, and take over their um, credit information. Uh, this one is relatively new as well. Uh, this is coming from Gmail using Google Docs. You're getting an uh, email that says, hey, there's a document I need you to look at, um, which is interesting. The link doesn't go to Google Docs, but it does go to Google. So it's, that's, again, if you're not paying attention, it, it's taken to a Google site. In fact, there's the login page on the Bogus website. It looks just like logging into Google. Um, you actually are going to get to a document, but they want you to sign in. That's what you're doing. And you say, well, I don't care. It's just my Gmail account. Yeah, but your Gmail account is probably tied to your Android, which is tied to your store, which you probably got your credit card stored in, which means now they're going to download a bunch of movies, apps, etc. And, you know, if they got access to your account, you may store your passwords and other information up there, look through your email, see where you do banking. Um, this one is spreading pretty rapidly as well. Netflix, this one's a little bit different. They're sending out, net, a lot of people have Netflix, you know, so they're sending out, hey, there's some kind of uh, unusual activity on your account, and they're providing you a customer service number to call. Call that number, they'll answer it as net, Netflix. As they're answering for Netflix, they said, well, we've seen some malicious activity on your account, looks like you're downloading movies, etc. cetera. Um, can you download some software so we can, you know, make sure everything's cleaned up? But what that's doing is actually giving its remote control software on the back end while you have them on the phone. You can see this, this was run through a security firm, and they said while he was on the phone with a rogue representative, they were busy searching his computer for things like bank information and passwords. So he was tracking what they were doing while he was on the phone. 
So, you know, so what? We've got all these phishing attempts and, you know, I'm not going to give what you say, I'm not going to give my credit card information, et cetera. I'm, I'm too slick for that. But what we're seeing is they're using this a lot more to uh, circumvent our security defenses to put malware, et cetera, on our network. So that's, it's getting slick. It's getting harder to detect. And, uh, you know, all the controls that we have in place are not foolproof. <coughs> There's a lot of methodologies um, how they get this rolled out. And, you know, and so why would an attacker use phishing? There's some other technique. Well, phishing's easy. I can, I can attack thousands of people with a click of a mouse, you know, just by sending an email. It doesn't take a lot of effort. Uh, most phishing attempts are performed at very low cost, use low cost technologies, uh, basic te uh, technology techniques, just a little practice, you could do it. It's low cost and high return on investment. In this average, we said earlier, one out of every 200. So that's, you know, I send out 10,000, I'm going to get a pretty good return on my investment. Phishing is difficult for an end user to detect, as we just saw, most end users when you're in a hurry. And, you know, talk about the tablets. Most people are going mobile. We talked about if I'm on a PC, I can hover over a link. How do you hover over a link on an iPad or on an Android or on your phone? That's a lot more difficult to see. Um, phishing is very effective. It works. That's why they continue to do it. That's why we're seeing a 90% increase year over year in phishing attempts. And then the number one reason why they do it, we talked about this last time, securing the human. Human is the most vulnerable part of any organization. There are just only limited controls we can put around this. So it's easy because there's phishing kits that are readily available. Domain registration takes seconds. You know, did you know they can set up a domain in a web server with um, GoDaddy, and GoDaddy will give you your money back in three days. What well, we just said, the average phishing site's only open up for 44 hours. So they're not really out of any money. They're going to put up a site, they're going to have it run for about 44 hours, get their money back from GoDaddy, and they're, they're gone and moved on, and they never even paid a dime for it. Many sites are easy to exploit, talking about um, uh, Joomla, talking about WordPress, etc. A lot of people put these in out of the box. They don't patch them, they don't update them, they don't change their fault username and password. They're in mass production, so it, they're a broad attempt for them to attack. And every time they take someone down, it's another opportunity to explore more, more phishing opportunities. Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, so here's a phishing kit. They're easy to configure, easy to deploy, and very effective. In fact, if you go out to YouTube, if you look on the right here, this is just a sample, like a page after page after page of videos to show you how to set up a phishing attack and they don't take just minutes to do if you watch a few of them. If you look, this is a basic, here on the left is a basic uh, directory listing of a website. We have some images, we have some JavaScript, some PHP files, and all this attack did was replace one file in this website. Confirm PHP, probably they went to this website, they're signing up for a newsletter or signing, logging in, and this is confirming that they logged in. All they did was change one line of code. So they changed one line of code which changed the email address or added to where the information was sent to. And even the, the web owner looking at this, oh, Katie? And someone on the call, Mark was asking, is there any way that, that we can get example, the examples that you share, can we get a copy of those to share with our customers who have on-site users? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're recording this session today for our internal use. Uh, Josh is writing a blog post for this as well that we can post people to and we're talking about taking this training out to the users here relatively soon as well but we're happy to share this uh, presentation with anyone who wants it so Thanks. Uh, if, you, if you go back and look there's a phishing IQ database we can see that this soft text to at gmail.com what they actually did was take over the Montreal ba uh, bank website with this confirmed.php file, which sent information to another website they had taken over, which is a valid website, commonlybuilders.net, which then sent that information onto them. So again, putting the old-fashioned techniques in place, we can't block valid web servers that have been taken over. It's, it's just too hard to combat. So what do we talk about? What do they typically catch? Credentials, account numbers, personal information, technical information, financial information, and this is the one I'm more concerned about for us, is compromising our systems. So we talked about a minute ago, uh, you know, what are some of the targets? Are they all broad? Well, a lot of them are, 
uh, randomly generated email addresses. We can see this coming through Spam Soap today. You can see they're going to tie everything from you know Bob at ABCCompany.com to Sally at ABC Company to I mean every name in the book, and especially the corporations. You're probably going to get hit when you do sales at, marketing at, IT at, help at. You know, so we get a you see a lot of things going through there. Focus targets. That's spear phishing. They're going to go after companies, employees, companies, customers, geographical locations. We've seen some of this. I'll give a couple examples. And then laser focus targets specific people, specific individuals. We recently had one that came to a couple of the managers. It was from the Department of Labor. And it talked about some unemployment benefits. And it named a specific individual who worked here recently and no longer works here. That's very targeted attack. When you looked at this email, something just didn't seem right about it. And sure enough, when we hovered over the links that it was trying to get us to go to to confirm information, it was taking us to a bogus website that was very, very close in, in naming and in, in style of the actual Department of Labor website. Um, we got one the other day from about a funeral. Like one of your close friends have died. Can you click on this? We'll give you more information about the funeral. Didn't get information who it was, but you, there's just a couple things. If you looked at the link, it was taking us to a wrong site. So again, they're going to prey on whatever is, you know, going to tug to get us to move. Is it is it a funeral? Is it Department of Labor because we're in trouble? Is it fraud alerts? Is it unusual activity on our bank account, uh, on our Netflix account? They're going to try whatever they can to get someone to buy. So here's some broad targets for phishing. Uh, I mean, who, who hasn't ordered something from Federal Express, especially our Christmas time? You know, a lot of people are expecting packages, and if you think you have something ready with your package, well, yeah, you're, you're expecting a, an email from Federal Express. Or how about this one? You want to get in touch with a, uh, an old friend on LinkedIn or maybe Facebook? Or, or I mean, who hasn't ordered something from Amazon? And it looks like there's trouble with your Amazon order. You need to click here and, and verify it. So again, I send this out to thousands of people. Somebody's ordered from something from Amazon, and somebody's expecting something right away, and they want to make sure it's getting here and don't want to delay. They're not going to pay attention. They're clicking through. Uh, here's a more focused uh, target example. You know, they're going after people who have Verizon accounts, um, going after people who have city accounts. So you can get that type of information from a variety of different sources. Um, so phishing camouflage. How do they hide some of these? But obviously the email domains we talked about. We talked about compromised web servers. Uh, they're using re uh, reasonable or similar domain names like the AEXP.com as opposed to AmericanExpress.com. Long URLs, I'm sure we've all seen this. If you look, it says HTTP slash slash PayPal.com. But that's not the end of it. It's got a lot of dots. In fact, if you go almost all the way down to near the end of the second line, it's actually .cdpvenezuela.com. So again, that's, that's easily for a non-technical person to fall victim of that, even at a first glance. DNS hijacking, that requires a little bit more work, but it can take over someone's DNS servers and reroute where their website is going to a secondary web server. And we talk about reasonable or similar domain names. So for example, what if I had trouble with my IRA or maybe a trust company, you know, sends me something out wrong with my account? Well. I'm thinking my benefits at work, etc. Mybenefits.com. Okay, that, that seems reasonable. They got some website they've come up with. I want to click on it, and move forward. Or have I, I got trouble with Bank of America? Is something wrong with my account? Some security issue, and so they put in a, a domain name of Bank of America dash accountsecurity.com. Again, those are not valid email addresses for those companies. Or how about Wells Fargo? That looks right, but three L's. So simple thing. I mean, they're they're very really slick. Again, if you're if you're panicking, if you're if there's something that you're trying to go through quickly, especially on a phone, a mobile device, you know, it's easy to fall victim to these. Um, here's one. This is this is the kind of stuff that makes me worry for our organization. You know, not so much, of, you know, about accounts and everything else. I think I think our I think our team is fairly knowledgeable, and but we can fall victim to this. If you look that in August of 2012, the Department of Revenue employee in South Carolina opened a phishing email. And I don't know what that phishing email was, but apparently there's some credentials that they gave out. About a week or so later, a hacker used those credentials to log into the system. A couple days later, they ran some utilities, steal passwords about six other servers on the network. A couple days later, they did reconnaissance on 21 more servers. Then about a week later, they dumped all this data to a staging directory and then uploaded it to some external site. 
the Secret Service, when they shut down that hacker site, found the data from the state of Carolina and let them know. They didn't even know they'd been breached. Carolina then had to disclose that breach to the public, and they had one million residents that they had signed up for credit monitoring at a cost of 12 million to the state. We're susceptible to this. I mean, if, if somebody here opened a phishing email and whatever gave out some credentials, maybe it was to spam soap, and they got through spam soap and started looking. We spent some password information, which we shouldn't do, but back and forth an email and got into an account. And if they uploaded three times as much data, it would not ring a bell in our network. I mean, we're hosting hundreds of networks, thousands of people, 75 gigs of data one day wouldn't ring a bell that there's something abnormal going on. So, you know. Again, wh why are we doing this? Why is it something se seemingly so simple as fishing are we bringing to our attention? Because it happens, and it happens frequently, and it's getting more sophisticated. So how do we stop it? Um, you know, when a fishing site's only up for less than two days, how do we act fast enough? How do we protect our brand? You know, what the sheer number of users attack increasing, just the volume, how do, how do we stay safe? Well, the first thing is the simple stuff, right? Guard against email spam. You know, several of our people who've gotten crypto locker through phishing attacks, they were actually stopped in the female filter and they released them. But then Exchange stopped them in their junk email and they released them and they still opened them up. So, you know, we, we, we put controls in place, but it still comes back to the people. You never trust a link. You know, don't click on links, download files or attachments from unknown senders. That's, that's pretty obvious, but I'll go as far as say, don't never trust a link and don't click on it from known senders. Go to the website directly. You get an email from AmericanExpress.com that says they want to up your credit limit. Go just just go to the website log in. If, if that offer is available through email, it'll be available when you logged into the website. If there's an alert, fraud alert in the email, there'll be a fraud alert on the website. Go to the website directly. Um, only open attachments when you're expecting them. You don't know what they contain. You know, I still I'm sure you guys still do, especially at home. I get uh, my wife's friends also. We get blast email from them and just cryptic, it doesn't look right, they've gotten attacked, sending attachments, trying to get us to open them up. You know, obviously these firewalls, spam filters, the antivirus, and the spyware, make sure you keep them up to date. You know, be cautious, stuff that doesn't make unrecognized senders, ask you to confirm personal financial information that aren't personalized. I got one the other day, said, Dear James, I'm not James, so <laughs> I knew that wasn't to me. And then we talked about this multiple times, that try to upset you by acting too quickly or threatening or with frightening information. Well, what doesn't work well? Well, you know, this stuff used to work well, manual blacklisting. And we used to do this back when we had, uh, I don't remember, what, what was our old spam filtering solution we had in-house? Uh, it was horrific. Anyway, we'd do manual blacklisting of these. Um, there's just too many sites. It's proliferating too fast. There's no way we can keep up with them, especially when they're hijacking valid sites. DNS blocking? Yeah, this works somewhat. We've got open DNS. They're aware some of this stuff is happening. But again, when it's only up for 44 hours, it's hard for them to catch. And then identifying the fishers, going through all the information, and trying to identify who they are, and putting procedures in place to block them. And they're just changing too fast, and the, the, the quantity is too vast for that to be effective. So what does work? And all this comes back, really, a lot of this comes back to the human perspective. We gotta use caution. We gotta use a lot of skepticism. Careful read the emails. We got education, what we're doing today. Share knowledge when we see stuff being spread. Obviously we gotta do patching operating systems applications and this one often gets left out, websites. We gotta patch the website, especially if we're running a Joomla, WordPress, or similar type of application on that. Spam filtering, DNS filtering, antivirus, and malware. So, you know, that's pretty much it. You know, the summary is, hey, the old stuff isn't working to protect us. Phishing's easy and effective. If we think we're not a target, you're, you're gonna get home mm -hmm. pretty soon. They, lot, they gather a lot of information, these for a variety of reasons. In me particular, I'm concerned about someone compromising our systems using, from a phishing attack. Um, you know, again, the takeaways are, it's increasing 87% a year. It's gonna cost a lot of money for us to mitigate if it ever happens. And we gotta to continue to educate our users internally and externally how to, how to thwart this. So again, this is short and sweet. This is, uh, oh, Katie's got a question? Yeah, um, Jesse Valentine asked, he says, I'm aware that we should report, <coughs> excuse me, any and all info on when we get crypto locker to management, 
but are there any others that we should specifically report? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we got a question for the guys that are on the phone. Um, what things should we report from a security perspective and what, you know, what warrants a security incident, basically, is what's being asked. We're, we're writing that up right now. I was on the phone with uh, lawyers yesterday getting some legal advice about what's really considered a security incident. You know, it's, if you really want to get technical, someone doing a sweeping ping across our network, you could say that's a security incident. Someone's poking around trying to figure out some open holes. Is that really necessary for us to log and report? And port scans, etc. So you know, we, there's 10% we know for sure we got a report. You know, someone's hacked in, someone stole information, we've lost equipment. That's a no-brainer. I think there's 10% on the bottom we know that's a no-brainer. We don't have to report it. I think there's 80% in the middle. I don't know what to do with. So we're trying to come up with a lot of examples. I'm writing. A lot, we'll have training on this relatively soon about what is a security breach, security incident, and then is a security incident considered a data breach. We're going to handle those. All, all of those are incidences, but not everything's a data breach. Data breaches require a whole lot more rigorous reporting and meticulous recording of what we do in that in those circumstances. So we're going to be training on that relatively soon. So I don't have a, a definite answer on should we be reporting all these phishing attempts or a crypto locker attempt. Crypto locker, let's report those, especially for healthcare. Anything you, you think might be questionable, let's report that, especially for healthcare. Um, but the other, there's other regulations coming down for other industries uh, that we have to be cognizant of, especially people who process credit cards, et cetera. So where's our role in that for our customers? What do we do for them? What do they do for, you know, what owners should they have? I'm trying to set the proper expectations because non-technical people are assuming we're doing a lot more in some areas than we're really doing. So do we really go and take on those things? How do we communicate that back to the customer more succinctly? So our training moving forward, uh, just one second, is a lot more succinct. Um, we'll have another training session next quarter, be on another topic. You can see, I think we were done in hopefully 30 minutes. Um, so we're, this is what we're going to do. It's very focused, um, not like we did last time, covering about five or six different topics. Be very focused. We'll do these once a quarter. Everything's going to be required. If you got a recommendation for a security uh, training class, let me know. Uh, if you want to teach one of these, let me know. I'll be happy to pass that along as well. Any other question? I was just going to ask, what does the FBI require you to uh, report to them, or do they have requirements? That yeah, you know, it, the FBI doesn't really require anything. It's really more of these federal regulations like HIPAA, PCI, uh, their state data breach laws that have to be dealt with. Um, if we have people who have publicly traded stocks, banks, financial institutions, mortgage companies, uh, insurance companies, all those now have uh, data breach reporting procedures around them. Which is interesting because when we got a, a crypto locker, you know, we're trying to figure out, well, you consider this a data breach because they say, well, the availability of the data was affected. It was, but the data was never compromised. The data never was lost. You know, there was never inappropriate. The integrity was there. The confidentiality was kept. You know, so we kind of went back and forth and in the security incident reports that we wrote up, which we'll show in, in our training here, we'll do hopefully end of April. Um, you know, we reported back to the customer, there's no information that we found that reports this information was compromised. The availability obviously was hindered, but do we need to report that? If you go out to the Department of Health and Human Services website, you can see all the data breaches that have been reported, and not a single one of them have the word crypto locker in them or the word virus in them. However, there's been a report published by Part Department of Health and Human Services saying everyone is reporting every virus they get, stop doing that. But there's no clear definition on what's reportable and what isn't. Do we have to do that on a virus by virus basis? And this is going to, that's going to be cumbersome. So as we're looking for an AV tool replacement, what's something that's a little bit more HIPAA compliant, it can produce these reports. Especially if it can produce a report, we could just put the onus back on the customer. Hey, we're, we're telling you all the viruses you had affected. Whether you need to report them or not, I don't know. We've met our obligation in the logging and reporting of that to you. So there's still a lot of stuff that has to be vetted out. We're putting logging centralized logging system in our facility, hopefully be reselling centralized logging for our customers here as well. It's still just a lot of kind of unknowns. These laws and everything were written by non-technical people. So, Anybody have any questions? All right, make sure you sign in if you didn't. If you're on the phone, Katie will be sending those forms back to you. Make sure you get them back to her. Again, if you don't get those back to you or her, we, we review this early next week, you'll be required to sit through this again.